Yeah, good morning, dear colleagues, Darren and colleagues. Thank you very much for the kind invitation to again contribute to your outstanding symposium. Would it be nice to come together in London, but traveling is still difficult. So therefore, I give this presentation as a recorded presentation. And you asked me to talk uh, about the therapeutic importance of SGLT2 inhibition heart failure as the new target. This is my conflict of interest slide. I do have interaction with various companies in the field. So what I'm going to do over the next 25 minutes or so is you, to share with you quickly some background information, then discuss data in patients with HEF-REF and HEF-PEF, and talk about mechanisms, and finally end by looking at the most recent guidelines of the European Society of Cardiology on heart failure and how the data published impact these recommendations. I think everybody's aware of um, how SGLT2 inhibitors act. They inhibit in the proximal tubule the SGLT2 receptor, and that leads to urinary glucose excretion, but in addition to that, to an increased excretion of sodium. And large trials conducted in patients with diabetes, because this drug has initially been developed to treat patients with diabetes, showed consistently a reduction of heart failure hospitalization in patients with type 2 diabetes. And this seems to be a class effect. And based on these data, dedicated trials were designed to look at the effect of these agents in patients with HEF-REF and HEF-PEF. Let's start and look at HEF-REF first. The first trial published, and I'm sure many of you are aware of these data, was the DAPHF trial including patients with an ejection fraction of 40 or below, elevated anti-pro-BNP, and these patients were randomized to dapagliflozin or placebo. And the primary endpoint was a classical endpoint for a heart failure trial, including the combination of worsening of heart failure or cardiovascular death. Median follow-up was one and a half years, and this is the primary endpoint, a very strong and robust reduction of this combined endpoint by treatment with dapagliflozin compared to placebo. And the number needed to treat is 21 to prevent one event. And as we've seen with patients with diabetes here, very early separation of the curves. So the effect seems to be kick in at a very early time point. If one looks at the single endpoint here, there was a significant reduction of uh, worsening of heart failure as well as on CV death. So the overall result is driven by both single endpoints. And all-cause mortality was also reduced. Treatment with dapagliflozin resulted in a significant reduction of all-cause mortality compared to placebo, as you can see here. One of the key questions was whether these results are true in patients with and without diabetes. And only a part, a, um, a certain part of patients had diabetes, but um, irrespective of the presence of diabetes or not, the SGLT2 inhibitors significantly reduced this combined endpoint. But of note here, if you look at the placebo group and the risk in patients with diabetes compared to non-diabetic subjects, there's, as we know from other data, an elevated risk for those with heart failure and diabetes to suffer from one of these endpoints. The second trial was emperor reduced, kind of similar population of patients with HEF-REF, randomized to empagliflozin versus placebo. And again, the classical primary endpoint for a heart failure trial, CV death or heart failure hospitalization, and then secondary endpoints. The primary endpoint, like we have seen in DAPA-HF, is a significant reduction of the combination of CV death or heart failure hospitalization by empagliflozin compared to placebo. The relative risk reduction is 25% and the number needed to treat 19, so comparable to what has been seen in the DAPA-HF trial. Secondary endpoints was, first of all, a heart failure endpoint first and recurrent hospitalization. And this is a very important endpoint for cardiologists because patients with heart failure are hospitalized. We often recompensate them, send them out, and they come back again. So we, we all know these kind of frequent flyers. So it is really of clinical interest to see whether this 
uh, recurrent hospitalizations can also be reduced. And if one looks at total hospitalization here, there's also a highly significant reduction. And another secondary endpoint was uh, changes in EGFR slope here. And as seen in pa with previous trials in patients with diabetes, also a significant reduction. Additional analysis looked at quality of life here. And one way to measure this in patients with heart failure is a score, is the uh, KCCQ score, and data were assessed after one year. And as you can see, compared to placebo, patients treated with empagliflozin had an increase in the KCCQ, reflecting an increase of quality of life. And this is important for patients to not only improve the prognosis, but also to impact the quality of their daily life. In addition, if one looks again at HbA1c at baseline, whether this has an effect here, and again looks at the primary endpoint, you can see this is a significant effect here in this um, analysis, again underscoring that the effect in heart failure patients is completely independent of the glucose lowering effect that we've seen in patients with diabetes. Then a pooled meta-analysis has been conducted to combine the data of DAPA-HF and Emperor reduced And one of the key questions was whether chronic kidney disease has an impact here. And so the group has been dichotomized in those with an EGFR below 60 and 60 and above. And as you can see here, all on the left side of the line of unity, underscoring that the effects are consistent in patients with CKD and without CKD. To summarize the clinical endpoints, um, the cardiology endpoints in these two trials, very robust reduction of the combined endpoint of first hospitalization for heart failure or CV death, and a robust reduction of CV death. So SGLT2 inhibitors based on these data are a new therapeutic option in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And if we put together these data, we now have data in patients with diabetes. We have with DAPA CKD data in patients with CKD, in which DAPA gliflozin, in addition to kidney endpoints, also reduced cardiovascular endpoints. And we have these combined data here from the two um, outcome trials, DAPA HF and Emperor reduced. Let's shift gears and look at the second important entity of heart failure, which is HEFPEF. And HEFPEF is a disease that is associated with many comorbidities and most important until Emperor Preserve was published, we did not have any therapeutic option to improve the prognosis here. And um, this changed when at ESC this year, Emperor Preserved was published looking at empagliflozin in patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. In this trial, patients had to have an ejection fraction of 40 or above and had to have signs of heart failure and an elevated anti-proBNP. And patients were randomized to empagliflozin versus placebo, almost 6,000 patients and median follow-up 26 months, so little over two years. Again, similar endpoint like in Emperor Reduced, time to first hospitalization for heart failure or CV death. And again, the secondary endpoints that I shared with you for the emperor reduced before. One quick look at the population. The population looking at ejection fraction included patients one third with an ejection fraction between 40 and 50, one third between 50 and 60, and one third above 60. So the whole range was covered here. This is the primary endpoint, a significant, highly significant reduction of the combined endpoint of CV death or heart failure hospitalization by empagliflozin and the number needed to treat here over two years is 31 to prevent one event. This is a combined endpoint, again, looking at the single components here. And you can see here, this is the hazard ratio for heart failure hospitalization, significant 29% of heart failure hospitalization reduction here, and CV death, also a clear trend, albeit the fact that this effect is not significant. But remember, the study was not powered for that. So let's look at subgroups. And I mentioned before the subgroups with the different ejection fractions. And you can see here very consistent effect in the three groups 
of ejection fraction below 50, 50 to 60, above 60, it seems, and this is hypothesis generating, that the effect is most prominent in those patients with an ejection fraction below 60, but additional analyses need to look at this in more detail. But otherwise, as you can see, all left on the left side of the line of unity, so very robust and consistent effect across all pre-specified subgroups. Secondary endpoint, again, the frequent flyer endpoint, first and recurrent heart failure hospitalization, also a very robust and highly significant reduction by empagliflozin compared to placebo. And please note here a very early separation of the curves underscoring what we have seen in patients with diabetes before that the effect kicks in at a very early time point also in this HEFPEF population. Again, the study included about 50% patients with diabetes and 50% patients without diabetes. And if you first look at the placebo group again at the overall risk, you can estimate here that patients with diabetes and have, um, have, have an elevated risk compared to subjects without diabetes. But irrespective of the presence of diabetes, empagliflozin reduces the primary endpoint. And you can see the p-value for interaction is not significant, underscoring again that this is totally independent of the presence of diabetes. So to summarize, Emperor preserved Empagliflozin significantly reduced the primary endpoint. It reduced the heart failure secondary endpoint of uh, first and recurrent events. And for the sake of time, I didn't show you in detail. The data also reduced the EGFR slope. So in summary, we can conclude from this trial that empagliflozin reduces the combined endpoint of CV death and heart failure hospitalization in patients with HEFPEF with and without diabetes. I mentioned that so far in the cardiology community, we did not have data showing an improvement in endpoints with various drugs in HEFPEF patients, candesartan, ACE inhibitors, spironolactone, even entresto, sacubitril, balsartan have been examined. And there was a trend, but not significant. So this is really a landmark trial showing that an SGLT2 inhibitor, in this case, empagliflozin, significantly reduced this primary endpoint. And this is very, very important for the treatment of these patients with HEFPEF. Let's look at potential mechanism. And I'd like to focus on three aspects here, hemodynamic effects, effects on hematocrit, and metabolic effects. I'd like to first share with you some data from a small study that we conducted in patients with type 2 diabetes at high cardiovascular risk. We randomized these patients to empagliflozin or placebo, and we hypothesized that the early effect seen on heart failure hospitalization was due to hemodynamic effect and changes in the cardiac index and system systemic vascular resistance here. And so we assessed these parameters non-invasively at day one, at day three, and after three months, and a secondary endpoint were echocardiographic parameters. First of all, let's look at urinary excretion. This is data from our study. You can see here already after one day, but consistently after three months, empagliflozin compared to placebo leads to an increase in urine volume by about 500 to 700 ml. And this has also been shown in other studies published last year. To our disappointment, Empagliflozin did not have an effect either on systemic vascular resistance index nor on cardiac index. So the early effect seen in this trial seems independent of effects here. But when we assessed echo parameters and in particular diastolic function, we could show that already after one day, treatment with empagliflozin significantly reduced E to E prime, which is a parameter for diastolic function. And this was preserved over three months. And this effect was mainly driven by a reduction in E, which reflects the ventricular loading. So our study raises the hypothesis that empagliflozin leads to an acute improvement in parameters of diastolic function, and that this effect lasts over a longer period. Another very elegant study was recently published looking at patients with heart failure irrespective of ejection fraction or presence of diabetes, who had an implanted pulmonary artery pressure sensor, the cardiomem system. This is a small sensor implanted invasively in the pulmonary artery, and it 
by telemetric means it transfers the pulmonary artery that can be uh, pressure that can be measured. And patients with these conditions where randomized stem paclifloxacin or placebo, and after 12 weeks, changes in diastolic pulmonary artery pressure was assessed and some secondary endpoints here. This is the population. About half of the patient had an ejection fraction below 40 or 40 or below, so they have REF. About 50% have PEF. And here you can see the new year classes. Half of them, new year class 3 and 4. So pretty uh, far down or pretty symptomatic with respect to their heart failure. And this is the primary result. The placebo group and the empagliflozin group, looking at the diastolic pulmonary artery pressure, you can see here a significant reduction by empagliflozin. And the difference is larger over time here, but starting very early again. And I think this is a finding consistent with what we have seen with the reduction of the ventricular filling here. So, and the investigators looked whether some of the changes may be due to changes in the dose of diuretics, in this case here, the daily furosemide equivalents. But you can see here in the group, this is the placebo group, this is the EMPA group, no difference. So they conclude from this study, from this study, that in patients with heart failure and cardiomems, pulmonary artery pressure sensor, empagliflozin produced rapid reductions in pulmonary artery pressures that were amplified over time, and most important, appeared to be independent of loop diuretic management. This is taken from a figure published a couple of years ago trying to explain how the reduction in fluid by SGLT2 inhibitors differs from loop diuretics here. And I might have shared these data with you already at one of the last presentations two years ago. Um, and in patients treated with SGLT2 inhibitors, there's a pronounced reduction of interstitial fluid by loop diuretics mainly lead to reduction in intravasal fluid. And this reduction here activates the neurohumoral system, and this seems not to be the case in patients treated with SGLT2 inhibitors. So the current hypothesis is that SGLT2 inhibitors may selectively reduce interstitial fluid, and this, that this may limit the reflex neurohumoral stimulation that occurs in response to intravascular volume contraction by other diuretics like loop diuretics. Let's look at effects on hematocrit. And this is taken from a very early analysis from the MPAREG outcome trial that Silvio and Suchi published. And this mediation analysis showed that, to a large extent, the effect seen in this diabetes trial was due to an increase in hematocrit. And we also looked at this in more detail in our study that I already shared with you before. And we could see that not after one day and not after three days, but after three months, Empagliflozin led to a significant increase in hemoglobin and hematocrit compared to placebo. So the lack of an early effect, despite the increased urinary volume, argues against volume contraction. So it seems indeed to be an increase driven by, for example, eposecretion. And others looked at this, and this is an analysis from a trial comparing placebo versus empagliflozin. And here you can see measuring EPO levels, a significant increase here already after one month, but consistent over a couple of months that EPO is elevated. And the question is, why does treatment with empagliflozin or other SGLT2 inhibitors lead to an increase in EPO? And we performed an analysis here looking at the full change in glucosuria compared to baseline versus the full change in EPO compared to baseline. As, as you can see here, there's a significant correlation between glucosuria and EPO increase, suggesting, suggesting that the more glucose is excreted, the um, higher is the increase in EPO. And the current hypothesis is that in patients with diabetes, due to the um, um, reabsorption of glucose, there's oxidative stress in the kidney, and that blocking the absorption of glucose may lead to a relief here and to um, a recovery of the cells producing APO, and that this may explain the increase. I think a very interesting aspect and which might explain to a certain extent the beneficial effects seen on the kidney and on the heart.
Finally, let's look at metabolic effects here. And this is a summary of some of the data that have been um, produced, published by my colleague, Michael Lerke. And just to remind everybody, the healthy heart mainly metabolizes fatty acids and to a certain extent glucose. In patients with heart failure, this metabolic flexibility here changes and glucose is metabolized, but it, which is less efficient. And the treatment of SGLT2 inhibitors kind of shift that again in various groups, including our own published data here, showing that there's an increase in the metabolism of fatty acid ketones and branched chain amino acids, which might be more effective with respect to ATP production in the heart. But I shared some of the effects with you, but Many other studies have been published here, and this is nicely summarized in this overview article published last year. And current thinking suggests that several mechanisms seem to contribute to it. And you all know, when we show such a slide, it means we know something, but to be honest, we don't really understand it. But many different effects could contribute here to the beneficial effects seen in the large cardiovascular outcome trials. Finally, let's look at the most recent ESC guideline recommendations on the treatment of patients with heart failure. And I shared with you the HEF-REF data and the HEF-PEF data. Unfortunately, the guidelines were published a day before the HEF-PEF data were published. So these data from Emperor Surf did not have a chance to get into the guidelines, but the HEF-REF data have led to a change in paradigm because initially for the treatment of heart failure, we had this algorithm to start with ACE inhibitor, beta blockers, MRA, and then change to the sacrobitril valsartan. And now based on the data that have been published for SGLT2 inhibitors, SGLT2 inhibitors, as well as the three other classes of drugs are now first line therapy in patients with HEFREF because they improve the prognosis. And I shared with you the data on SGLT2 inhibitors showing the very early effect. And so current recommendations are that all of these drugs could, should be started ideally within 30 days to make sure that people, that patients benefit from these drugs as early as possible. And with that, I'd like to conclude. SGLT2 inhibitors reduce the combined point endpoint of CV death or heart failure hospitalization in HEF-REF and HEF-PEF patients. These data we so far do only have for empagliflozin. In patients with or without diabetes, SGLT2 inhibitors are recommended for patients with HEF-REF to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization or CV death, and various mechanisms seem to contribute to the beneficial eff effect seen in the large cardiovascular outcome trials. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Mm -hmm.